Good morning. I'm Sharon Squassoni, Director of the Proliferation Prevention Program. We are webcasting this this morning, so um, this is completely on the record. I ask you to turn your cell phones off, please, so that we don't have any um, untoward disturbances. And I would also ask you, if you're towards the back of the room, I know it's nice to look out the window, but why don't we come forward? We have some empty spaces. If anybody wants to come a little closer, any takers or people on the side who are sitting uh, on the side, you can welcome to join us at the table, please. So it is um, my pleasure to welcome Manpreet Sethi today. Um, the last time I saw you was in Vietnam. <laughs> it could be at another meeting. But um, Dr. Seti um, is here in town on some other business, so we thought we would take advantage of her uh, travel and welcome her to CSIS. She is a senior fellow at the Indian Council of Social Science Research, which is affiliated with the Center for Air Power Studies in New Delhi. Um, and she has her PhD, I'm assuming JNU is That's right. Jawaharlal Nehru University. <laughs> uh, author of two books, Nuclear Strategy, India's March Towards Credible Deterrence, and also a book about Argentina's nuclear policy. And she is also a member of the Prime Minister's informal group on disarmament and uh, does a lot of track to initiatives, one of which we were together on um, in Vietnam recently. So um, she has some slides. We will, I think we have until 10.30 this morning. So um, we'll um, let Manpreet speak for, I don't know, 20 minutes or 30 minutes, whatever. Uh, and then we will open the floor to questions. We do have, you know, coffee, tea, refreshments outside. Um, there is no exit from this room over here, so don't, I've been fooled many times. You have to go back that way, so if uh, you need to exit the room, you need to move towards the back. So I will hand it over to Manpreet. Thank you so much, Sharon, and good morning to everyone. It really is such a pleasure to be at this uh, swanky new building of the CSIS. Uh, in fact, last year when I happened to meet Sharon in Vietnam, uh, I had expressed a desire uh, to come to the CSIS. And since I was going to be visiting Washington, she was kind enough to set this up. And uh, it really, I mean, I really appreciate in this cold weather for you to come out so early in the morning. Uh, but I hope we will have a good discussion on a subject uh, which is of, of great concern to me, and I think it is of interest to everyone around the world. Uh, and what we are looking at, uh, you know, is India's nuclear challenges, um, which is uh, what Sharon and I thought we could broadly structure it. But um, in order to look at it in a more focused way, I have uh, divided India's nuclear challenges into three uh, sets of groups. Uh, the first one that I want to look at is in the strategic sphere, which is deterrence stability, uh, the complexities of establishing nuclear deterrence uh, for a country like India, which has, I think, unprecedented nuclear challenges. No other nuclear weapon state has the set of complex deterrence relationships that India is having to find its way around. So that's one uh, you know, basket that I want to look at. The other one is in the energy sphere, because India does have an ambitious nuclear power program. And while there were roadblocks earlier in terms of India's non-participation in the NPT, and therefore non-participation in international nuclear commerce, that has been taken away. But it has been sort of replaced by a set of other challenges that I want to talk about uh, in the second part. And in the third part, I want to look at the non-proliferation challenges that India still faces. And these are largely coming from, uh, as I say, the old shibboleths, you know, where people are still stuck to the old guard thinking on non-proliferation, despite the fact that India uh, has made several attempts to be a part of the non-proliferation regime, which is wider than just the NPT. And it, it's in that context that I want to look at the third set of challenges. So this is largely how, how I'm going to go about it. Let's start by looking at the challenges of nuclear deterrence. And as I want to point out to you, it's not news, it's something that many of you would be aware of, but let me just try and structure what is India's nuclear reality. And you know, 
in order to explain what those complexities are when we look at deterrence uh, as a challenge. What India has are, uh, you know, with us uh, is two geographically contiguous nuclear powers. So India is literally sandwiched between China and Pakistan, which are the two geographically contiguous uh, nuclear weapon states that we have. With both of these countries, there, is, uh, there are territorial disputes and there is a history of wars. And I'm very consciously putting here territorial disputes. It's not just border disputes, which is one aspect of it, but it's more than that. Entire states of India are claimed by Pakistan on one hand in terms of Kashmir and Arunachal Pradesh, 80,000 square kilometers of a state of India, which is claimed by China. So there are territorial disputes here with nuclear weapon states. Both of these countries have different nuclear doctrines and capabilities. Uh, both have different trajectories in terms of the kind of capabilities they are building up, uh, different doctrines. China has a no first use doctrine, Pakistan has a first use doctrine, uh, different uh, levels of capability that they want to hit at in order to have deterrence, different threat perceptions that they have. While for Pakistan, it's completely India-centric and nothing beyond that. For China, there's a different set of deterrence challenges that they face. So this is what uh, India is looking at. Both of these countries with which India has territorial disputes are in a robust nuclear and missile proliferation <laughs> relationship. So between themselves, uh, there is a very close nexus that we have seen in the past, and it, it, it continues in the same format. Um, many of you might be aware, and this is common knowledge now, that through the 1970s and 80s and 90s, uh, there was this a large amount of transfer of nuclear material, technology, weapon tests, weapon designs, which, were, which came in from China to Pakistan. Uh, A.Q. Khan, who is the father of the Pakistani nuclear program, is on record to have put this down uh, as to the amount of, you know, uh, uh, amount of help that came uh, on how many aircraft which came from uh, China to Pakistan carrying the material that they needed to get a nuclear power, a nuclear weapons program. And there's an American scholar who said that if one was to subtract the Chinese help from the Pakistani nuclear program, there wouldn't be a Pakistani nuclear program. So it's that close a relationship that the two have shared in the past on uh, the nexus between nuclear and missile. A number of missiles in the Pakistani arsenal have a Chinese origin. Both these countries use proxies to complicate security. So it's not just the use of the non-state actor, the terrorist organizations by Pakistan. It's also the use of Pakistan by China uh, as a proxy in order to complicate security, not just for India, I would say even for the US. Uh, so this is, again, you know, a huge uh, reality that India faces. So what we end up having are two nuclear dyads with India, Pakistan, India, China, and one nuclear triangle. And as I said, this is unprecedented. No other nuclear weapon state has faced this kind of a relationship. And therefore, when we get to establishing deterrent stability in this kind of a relationship, uh, you land up with lots of complexities, which are different from what was and rather nostalgically, I found people look back at the Cold War period when there was just a bipolar you know, confrontation that one had to cater for. It's so different today. There are existential risks of nuclear war. Uh, and during the Cold War, we've lived with them uh, between the US and the USSR. And by extension, the world has lived with them in terms of accidents, miscalcula uh, miscalculations, unauthorized launches. All those possibilities have always been there wherever there are nuclear weapons. And with geographically contiguous powers, uh, you can understand how much these complexities go up, especially if capability buildup happens of a certain type, and we'll talk about that. And the last threat that India faces, uh, which is India's reality, is the threat from the non-state actor. The non-state actor, which has been created, sponsored, uh, supported, armed by a state which believes that terrorism is a viable tool of foreign policy. Um, in recent times, uh, it has been claimed that Pakistan itself has become a victim of a lot of non-state actor activity, and therefore they have realized the folly of doing this. But up till now, what India has faced is this reality, and therefore the challenges of nuclear terrorism, uh, with or without state complicity, uh, becoming active in a region which is prone to terrorism is something that we cannot actually you know, dismiss easily. So this is the kind of reality that India has on the nuclear front. 
what are some of the visible nuclear weapons trends as we see in, you know in the region there is inventory build up china has the biggest arsenal after us and russia even though it's claimed to be between 250 and 450 nuclear warheads but even then it is the largest that we have amongst the nuclear weapon states um after us and russia pakistan is likely to be the fifth largest um at the rate at which they are growing with their fissile material we see improvements happening in the range accuracy and reliability of missiles so they're moving from liquid to solid fuel mobile missiles and this is happening across the board in the three countries uh, dispersal of missiles over the triad all the three countries have expressed an interest in having a triad they are at different levels of getting to that you know situation where uh, the sea based leg of the triad will become operational over the decade uh improvements in penetrability of missiles because and that especially in the case of china which is looking at the us as its terms of a term of reference and if that is the point that they are looking at for their threat perception uh the american bmd the ballistic missile defense creates a lot of complications despite the fact that the americans have been arguing in every forum to say it it's not meant to impact either russia or china Uh, but that's not how it's being perceived outside and they're looking at how they would be able to penetrate defeat saturate the missile defenses and some of the effect uh, some of the developments which are happening therefore are missiles which are equipped with countermeasures in order to be able to penetrate the missile defense merved missiles uh, which china has not had in the past though they have demonstrated the capability to have multiple independently retargetable vehicles on their missiles and even merved missiles which are maneuverable reentry warheads uh, which can you know take different trajectories in order to evade interception so these are some of the trends that we see um, cruise missile proliferation if ballistic missile defense is what these countries are talking about then one way of defeating that missile defense is through cruise missile proliferation and we have seen how the cruise missiles of different uh, uh, ranges have been coming up in the region very quickly let me try and disaggregate this deterrence relationship between india china and india pakistan and how you know i view it with china there is a general sense of nuclear stability uh surprisingly uh even though india does see it as a long term nuclear threat in the near and medium term there is a sense of nuclear stability which i think is largely coming from a set of factors firstly there is similar nuclear doctrines declared doctrines of both countries express no first use which mean they will not be the first to introduce nuclear weapons which allows even if it's a declaratory doctrine uh it it show it reflects uh, or the seriousness of the commitment of no first use reflects in the capability build up <coughs> so if you're not going towards first strike weapons but developing more of survivability measures in your nuclear arsenal uh it tends to indicate that you're serious about no first use so largely the trajectories have been in that direction up till now focus of both the countries is on economic growth and social development none of them wants to be distracted from what is seen as the objective of bringing up you know the billion of population that each one of us has uh and remaining stuck remaining focused on economic growth high bilateral economic trade between the two countries which has led to you know the creation of the constituencies of peace and business uh um, the volume of trade is going up phenomenally though it is skewed against india in terms of what we export to, uh, to them many levels of political engagement that exist between the two countries mechanisms for um uh, talking about uh, a range of issues including you know military exercises on counter terrorism which has uh, which have taken place and there is an acceptance of mutual vulnerability to unacceptable damage uh, which has been the bedrock of deterrence which goes to you know um, uh, reinforce stability in deterrence some of the worrisome trends however with china are that there is a growing military capability uh, we are all aware of that there is lack of clarity on intentions and this is not just an indian worry it's a worry in the region as to how would china use the capability that is coming up and china has started becoming much more assertive than it used to be display of confidence in that military capability through certain measures of assertiveness which have happened uh, in different parts of of asia 
With India particularly, there is a low interest in settling territorial issues. And as I pointed out to you earlier, there are border issues and there are territorial issues. And the nettlesome behavior on Arunachal Pradesh, where, for instance, China, uh, when there are, are uh, uh, sit, uh, uh, you know, people from Arunachal Pradesh applying for visas to go to China, uh, they, they've been told, you don't need to apply for a visa because you are Chinese. Uh, you know, things like that, or stapled visas being provided for people from Kashmir. So those kind of little irritants. There was, um, for instance, uh, an incursion from China into Indian territory uh, in this region, uh, and they stayed put uh, in India for 30 days. Uh, but as I said, the focus was on economic growth, and therefore all efforts were made to resolve it diplomatically. So despite the kind of media hype that happened in India, and China, in fact, chided India for the media, you know, which was creating this kind of a situation. But these are some of the irritants that keep happening in the relationship. We've seen the anti-satellite test of China in 2007. We've seen BMD tests in 2010, which go to show that the military capability build up and the use of asymmetric, what China calls its assassin's maze strategy, where it's not going to be just looking at direct military capability build up in terms of tank for tank, you know, aircraft for aircraft, but build asymmetric capabilities in order to defeat what it thinks are its rivals. Large deployment of conventional missiles, conventionally tipped medium range, short range ballistic missiles, uh, looking towards India, uh, nearly 1500 of them are already deployed. And the ambiguity comes in because the second artillery force, uh, which also looks after nuclear capable missiles, is also in charge of conventional missiles. So that brings in an element of you know, uncertainty in, in what could be the missiles that get launched in a moment of crisis. And of course, the relationship with Pakistan, which I've mentioned to you earlier, uh, remains one of the worrisome trends. Let's look now at Pakistan's nuclear strategy. For Pakistan, the role of its nuclear weapons is very clear, and I think it's very well known. It is to deter a conventionally superior military. It is conventional deterrence that they're looking at. Uh, nuclear deterrence, that is deterrence of India's nuclear capability, is the least important function of Pakistan's nuclear weapons. It's meant to deter the conventional capability. Now, if it remained at that, it was fine. Things would be stable, because they want to deter conventional capability, fine. That's how it has worked for many nations. But they want to deter this conventional capability while acts of terrorism continue. And that then becomes provocative because then, you know, there will be a response at some point from India, uh, which is exactly what they're trying to shield themselves against with the presence of that nuclear weapons. And obviously, you can understand that that creates all kinds of problems for India. The manner in which Pakistan exercises this strategy is by a deliberate projection of uncertain behavior to heighten the nuclear danger. And I, I particularly want to put this out for an audience like this because there is so much writing that comes out from, from Western sources, which tends to put the onus of responsibility on you know the sober and the mature India, that you should be able to take these provocations but remain uh, sober about it, because what you have on the other side is an irrational actor. But what I'm trying to you know, explain that this is a projected irrationality. And in deterrence theory, uh, we've, we've, I think, all read out the article on political uses of madness, where projected irrationality goes to enhance deterrence. And that is exactly what Pakistan is doing. And this brinkmanship, this irrationality, is not just aimed at India. It's aimed at the international audience as well in order to convince them that it's an uncertain situation. It's a dangerous neighborhood. And you don't know if there was any response that India was to do uh, in the conventional realm, it will uh, it'll spiral out of control and lead to nuclear escalation. Their move towards tactical nuclear weapons is exactly in order to reinforce that instability. Um, you know, India, uh, and, and I agree with Pakistan when it says that they have the tactical nuclear weapons, they're going towards that direction in order to, as uh, <coughs> General Khalid Kidwai, who was in charge of the SPD, the Strategic Plans Division of Pakistan, till just about a month ago, said the, the purpose of tactical nuclear weapons of Pakistan is to pour cold water over cold start. Cold start is the Indian doctrine, uh, military doctrine, which has now been disclaimed and it's called proactive strategy. But the purpose of this doctrine has been that there would be a rapid response 
from India in case of an act of terrorism, which is traced back to Pakistan. Um, and there won't be the conventional buildup as we have seen in the past, but it will be a much more rapid response to that. And Pakistan, obviously, if the purpose of their nuclear weapons has been to stop such a response, and if India begins to claim that there is possibility of carrying out such a response under the nuclear overhang, that you know you, you can conduct a conventional war without nuclear weapons coming into play, then it defeats the purpose of Pakistan's nuclear weapons. And therefore, they have to find a way of reclaiming that space that India says exists for a conventional war by suggesting that you don't have that space because the moment you come in, we will use a tactical nuclear weapons. Uh, so the early use of a battlefield weapon uh, on a military target, perhaps in Pakistani territory, uh, is, being, is being projected with the assumption that India will then not retaliate that it will happen in Pakistani territory, it led to hardly any damage, and therefore a soft country like India would probably not be able to retaliate to this. So that's the assumption on the Pakistani side. Now, uh, the Indian nuclear doctrine on this is very clear. Irrespective of the yield, the damage done, irrespective of the, of the target, uh, there will be a response from India. And deterrence stability is manipulation of this perception, that there is credibility in what India is saying in terms of there being a response to the use of any kind, because it breaches a certain level, a certain red line, and any use of a nuclear weapon will result in a use of a, reta a nuclear retaliation. Uh, but as far as the Pakistani strategy, their mindset is concerned, they are trying to derive deterrence from the kind of instability that has been generated through the projection of tactical nuclear weapons. I have my doubts about whether they will actually deploy tactical nuclear weapons at any stage. It's, it's probably just a policy of brinkmanship in order to deter India further. Uh, and over and above that, on the strategic stability front with Pakistan, there's been an unsatisfactory experience of confidence building measures. Though India, uh, both countries actually started out on nuclear CBMs very soon after their nuclear tests in 1998. We have a Lahore, understand, Lahore Memorandum of Understanding of 1999, which lays down some very useful steps on CBMs. But then Kargil, the incursion of Pakistan into India in a covert manner happened in May 1999, and the CBMs have never gotten anywhere because every once in a while there's this hiccup of um, terrorist activity that happens and it derails whatever process has been in place. Okay, let's move on now to the challenges in nuclear energy expansion. <clears throat> the present status of nuclear energy in India is like this. There are 21 operational nuclear power plants. Two of these are boiling water reactors uh, that are of the American vintage, uh, Tarapur 1 and 2. And then there are 18 PHWRs, pressurized heavy water reactors, which indigenously have been built. The largest capacity factor that India has right now is a 540 megawatt, two plants of those in Tarapur 3 and 4. The first light water reactor has come up in the southern part of India, a place called Kudankulam, which went critical last year. And it's uh, going to start uh, providing commercial electricity early this year. 3% of the total electricity generation of India is coming from nuclear power right now, uh, which is at 4780 megawatt, which will become 5000 the moment uh, the light water reactor uh, gets connected to the grid. What India has is roughly 350 reactor years of experience uh, running these 21 <coughs> operational plants, a full fuel, fuel cycle capability, from so from uranium mining, uh, to reprocessing, uh, it's all being done in-house. Train manpower to be able to cater for this and a mature nuclear industry. Because since India was isolated from any international commerce in this field, all of it has been indigenously catered for. So the industry itself is mature enough to provide the kind of uh, vessels, equipment, material that is needed for uh, a 540 megawatt. But what India is building now are all 700 megawatt plants, and that is what is going to be the standardized format of uh, plants in the future. The ambition is that we need we, that we we should be able to get to 20,000 megawatts by 2020, which means only six years from now, and we are nowhere near it. 63,000 megawatts is what the prime minister has stated by 2032. Uh, which will come largely from 20 imported light water reactors. 
in eight new nuclear parks. And this is where the problem lies, because after Fukushima, public acceptance um, has become such an important issue that uh, acquisition of new land for these eight new nuclear parks is where the biggest hurdle will be. Um, indigenous 700 megawatt plants are coming up in sites which were already existing. So this uh, part of the program is on track. And uh, the, the prototype fast breeder reactor, uh, which is the only one of its kind that is being built in the world, uh, will become operational this year. Uh, it was to become operational in 2012 and then 2013. And what we've been told now is that this year it definitely will become operational. But the plan is to go in for two 500 megawatt fast breeder reactors uh, over the next uh, uh, decade or so. Now, if you look at the ability to achieve these goals, this is what, what has been laid down on paper. But how do we get to that? In the past, India was handicapped by international sanctions and isolations. Uh, this we managed to get over after between uh, 2005 and 2008-9, uh, there was this whole series of steps at the multilateral level and at the bilateral level with the US, which allowed India to enter international nuclear commerce. When this happened and the opportunities opened up, between 2008 and 2011, there were cooper uh, nuclear cooperation agreements that were signed with 10 countries in just three years. So these were waiting to happen. It led to a spurt in nuclear fuel availability, and therefore the capacity factors of plants, which had come down drastically between in the early 2000s till about 2010 or so, went up to 90%, because fuel was the immediate benefit that India could get once it was exceptionalized uh, by the NSG. The import of larger reactors, now the agreements have been signed in terms of memorandums. Uh, work is going on, however, land acquisition on the Indian side and the conclusion of commercial contracts uh, bilaterally is something which is held up for various reasons and we'll talk about that. But this is uh, in principle what was approved that we will get to 30,000 megawatts uh, quickly uh, when we were looking at it from 2008 to about 2010 perspective. Fukushima happens in 2011, and I would say it happened just at the wrong time for India. I mean, it, it's a wrong time wrong for time any for such uh, for any such thing to happen at any time, <laughs> but particularly for India, which uh, was looking at a rapid expansion of its nuclear power program after the initial you know bottleneck had been cleared, has run into several other bottlenecks now. Firstly, restoring public confidence uh, because. That has been completely shaken. Uh, even though there has been no fatality to radioactivity actually at Fukushima, it's largely been the earthquake and the tsunami which has created the trouble. But um, in public mind, nuclear safety has come under a cloud. And therefore, uh, what we need in order to get over this hurdle is a proactive engagement for the nuclear establishment in India at two levels. And in the past, I would say this hasn't really happened because the tendency was that the DAE, the Department of Atomic Energy, says this is where we want to set up a plant. The land is acquired by the state, and you go ahead and you know set up the plant. It's no longer possible like that, especially not in a vibrant democracy like India. So what we need to do now is to explain the strategic requirement for nuclear electricity at one level and have an inclusive approach for the population of the location where the plant is to come up at the tactical level. So people uh, you know, need to know more about why you want to set up this plant here. Why is it my land which has to be taken up for this? What is the purpose? How is my life going to benefit from it? How are my children going to benefit from it? So a whole range of proactive strategy in terms of reaching out to people. And that is happening very quickly. If you look at how the outreach activities and if anybody is interested, you can look at the uh, website of the Department of Atomic Energy, uh, which lays down every month as to what is the kind of outreach activity they've done, reaching out to schools, colleges, all kinds of constituencies to make people understand uh, the need for nuclear power and why it needs to come up in a particular place. The other issue is the liability issue. And I think that will be of a great concern everywhere. Um, Investors, uh, the nuclear industry in India and internationally have shown concerns about the nuclear liability law because 
Um, and there is a background as to why the liability law came up in such a manner. One, it was a requirement because the US nuclear industry wanted to invest in nuclear power in India. And that was a part of the Indo-US nuclear deal arrangements. Um, but the liability issue, the law was passed in 2011. The rules of implementation came out later in uh, late 2011. Uh, it has put down certain restrict certain uh, areas of concern for the investors by suggesting that they will be liable for uh, for providing compensation in case of an accident over a period of time. Now, one way of getting around this, this is Indian law. So it, it, it really can't be gotten over unless there is an amendment to the law, which is not going to happen quickly because there is a background, as I said, to why the liability law came up in this manner. At the moment when the liability law was being negotiated and legislated was also the time when the Bhopal gas tra tragedy uh, verdict was to come up in India. And that is a huge baggage that the country carries in terms of an MNC getting away from providing adequate compensation despite uh, the chemical blast that happened in Bhopal um, uh, in India. And the other was Fukushima. So it's in the backdrop of these two events that the liability law gets enacted. And therefore, it is quite stringent and, and gets the operator, the Nuclear Power Corporation of India, which is the operator of all Indian plants, and so will it be for imported plants that come in, uh, for them to have recourse to the supplier for liability. And that is where the problem is. Uh, how we are trying to get over this problem is by uh, getting probabilistic uh, safety analysis done of each component in order to get the Atomic Energy Regulatory Board to specify the life of that component uh, or, or, the, or the licensing of the plant which is done over five year periods. And therefore you will be able to have the recourse to liability from, from the supplier only for that five year period. Uh, also, the NPCIL might have the right to waive off the right to recourse in its commercial contracts that get negotiated with the nuclear industry. So that's uh, how largely the debate is within the country on how you try and get over this problem. But there is a recognition that there are issues here that, that have to be addressed. Very lastly, on the challenges from the non-proliferation shibboleths uh, that, and these largely come, I think, from uh, the non-proliferation walas uh, who are still have that angst over the Indo-US nuclear deal. So there is a tendency to smart over this exceptionalization that was granted to India. Uh, obviously, I mean, not everyone is happy that this came about, uh, but I would say it was one way of accommodating, uh, you know, a country uh, which had shown a certain record, a certain behavior, uh, which had certain amount of needs <coughs> in the nuclear energy sector and therefore needed to be accommodated. So a via media was found on how you would be able to do that. But the tendency is to blame the USA for not extracting enough from India for the deal that was granted to them in terms of not getting a, you know, a more a credible guarantee on the CTBT, the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, or, or on some other aspects. And the tendency is to blame India for anything that is going wrong uh, in the non-proliferation regime. And the latest is the Sinopark nuclear cooperation. So the justification for that is that there, this was a precedent that was set by the Indo-US nuclear deal. So it's fine now that uh, you know there is this cooperation going on between China and Pakistan. And I want to really, you know, uh, point that out that it's just not uh, factually correct and it should not be accepted in that sense. There's little appreciation of Indian efforts to be a part of the non-proliferation regime. I mean, India has not been a part of the NPT, but it has supported the principles of the NPT and the larger regime in its many other dimensions. That has always been what India's approach and strategy has been. Some of the facts on the Indo-US nuclear deal. Um, between 2005 and 2008, it was a negotiation between two democracies and two very vibrant democracies with bureaucracies which are extremely conservative and it's only the push at the highest political level that got us this agreement. Otherwise, left to the bureaucracies, it largely would have you know, died uh, very quickly. Uh, but uh, the media, which was so skeptical on both sides and always crying foul that you know, there was some kind of underhand uh, deals which were being stuck between India and Pakistan, India and uh, USA in order to get this. So this is the kind of environment uh, with the transparency uh, that the negotiations actually went on between 2005 and 2008. 
due legislative process in both the countries was undertaken to create the legal conditions. Uh, and I remember the, the, the anger that was in India with the Hyde Act when it was passed as to how it is going to bind India in certain ways. When India was negotiating legislative processes within the country, the amount of, you know, uh, to and fro that went on between the two. But in the end, it's not just a bilateral agreement between India and USA. There is a one to three agreement which has been signed on nuclear cooperation. But the exceptionalization has come from a larger process which is more multilateral. So you've got compliance with the IAEA. Uh, in terms of the additional protocol that India has signed with IAEA and the NSG process, which is 46 countries working by consensus, providing that exceptionalization to the country. So it's not something which has come easily, which, uh, you know, hasn't followed the due process. The exceptionalization, therefore, as I put it, has been earned by India on two grounds, consistent behavior, responsible behavior on, on the nuclear front and non-proliferation commitments. If you look at what some of these non-proliferation commitments are, and they're not you know, easily dismissible, sustained moratorium on nuclear testing. And if you remember, when India made this uh, claim, uh, made this, uh, provided <coughs> this guarantee that we will stick to moratorium on nuclear testing, which is unilateral, um, it was in the backdrop of a debate which was happening within the country whether the nuclear tests which had happened had performed to yield. So it was a great risk that the country, that the, that the government was taking in terms of sticking with the unilateral commitment on nuclear testing, support for FMCT, the Fissile Material Cutoff Treaty, signing of the additional protocol with the IAEA. And we had uh, just last year uh, the Director General of IAEA visiting India in order to oversee the implementation of the safeguards procedure. And uh, he did say that everything was going very smoothly and he was happy with the progress that the country had made in implementing the separation plan, uh, which was offered as part of the deal. Uh, Cyrus, which is the research reactor that India had been running for producing plutonium for the nuclear weapons program, has been shut down. Uh, the safeguards on the 14 other facilities that India had offered as part of the separation plan are going on. Um, Participation in the Nuclear Security Summit, I think, has been one of the highlights, uh, in, which has been extremely important uh, from the Indian point of view in bringing the focus on nuclear terrorism. So material security, given that we are in a region which is prone to any such kind of activity, as I pointed out earlier, with or without state complicity, is something that India is extremely conscious of and very keen on getting that nuclear security summit process in its many dimensions actually being implemented well. Uh, the Prime Minister had, uh, had uh, committed to setting up a global center on nuclear energy partnership. And just last month, uh, uh, the foundation stone for setting up the center has been put in place. Harmonization of export controls, uh, negotiations with the Hague Code of Conduct on missiles, all of this uh, has been going on over a period of time. And the trigger lists, uh, according to the Foreign Secretary of the country, is actually sometimes going ahead of just the export controls which are available in, uh, in the international regime. And yet the NSG membership is not yet in sight for India. <laughs> Um, and that does create its own problems within the country because there is a keenness to join the, uh, the larger regime through the various, uh, you know, NSG and the MTCR, Australia Group, VASNR agreements, which are in, in, in existence. Uh, and you want to engage with them, but that is not coming about very quickly. Now, just in the last slide, I want to contrast how India went about getting that Indo-US nuclear deal with what is the situation on the Sino-Pak <coughs> nuclear cooperation. Because if that onus of responsibility is being shifted to the Indo-US nuclear deal, I think uh, we need to look at some facts. The Sino-Pak nuclear cooperation predates the deal. It was in 1986 that this relationship first started in civilian nuclear cooperation. The military agree you know, arrangement was much earlier than that. But in 1986 is when for the first time the agreement gets signed. It's in 1991 that they set up uh, the, the contract for, for uh, constructing Chashma 1, uh, which is the first Chinese nuclear power plant to come up in Pakistan. It became operational in 1999. And just before China joined the NSG in 2004, uh, the agreement was signed for setting up another plant, Chashma 2, uh, which China then claimed was uh, part of the earlier deal. 
Two more plants have since been claimed as being grandfathered under the same arrangement. And what we're talking about in today's times are four more plants which are to come up in Karachi, uh, which is a different site altogether, which will be 1000 megawatt plants compared to what the Chashma plants were 300 megawatt. And uh, while China claims that this is part of the, uh, under the IAEA safeguards, it's certainly not uh, living up to the rules of the NSG as China's membership uh, would, would, should, uh, you know, keep them up with. Um, and largely there is NSG silence on this. Uh, no procedures have been followed, no processes are being put into place. There is a de facto exemption which has been, you know, given to Pakistan on the arrangement that China has on nuclear energy cooperation. And therefore, the question that I want to end with is to throw it open to you as to who is undermining the NSG credibility. Is it the, the relationship that actually went through the entire process of, of legally you know, establishing that it was possible to create that exceptionalization? Or is it a relationship which is in complete violation of any of these processes, uh, which is not willing to even discuss in the NSG as to what this is? So is that silence undermining the credibility of the NSG, or is it what was followed by law? And I'll stop here and look forward to your comments, criticism, views <laughs> on this subject. Thank you so much. Thank you, Manpreet. <laughs> I, um, I asked you to put a lot on the table, and you really did. So uh, we have a lot to talk about this morning. I'm going to just say, for those of you who want to get some coffee or something, now would be a good time uh, <coughs> while you gather your thoughts. Do you need any tea? I just or need some water. Let's okay. set. Hold on a second. Bobby or Jake, could you get Manpreet some water? Just a glass of water. You should take a moment to stretch and then we'll five minutes we'll be back. So I know this mic was great. Enjoy. Good morning, sir. Good morning. How Thank you, are you so much for coming. And <laughs> but we were just a, saying that always you've got a pleasure to, to hear thank from you, you. Oh, Sharon. Thank you, Michael. You're looking pretty stylish. Well, thank you. So are you. <laughs> it's good to see you. Thanks for this. You missed the first part of Manfred's um, talk, where she talked a lot about deterrence and everything else. So I hope you'll. We, we talked about that yesterday as well when <laughs> okay. we were in that. Uh, but yes, I would have liked you to see the way I'd structured I, this. My error. I had this meeting down for 9.30, uh -huh. yeah, but if I could see
All right, I think we have a quorum to get started again. We have three um, basic sets of topics. One is deterrence and nuclear relationships. Um, another is sort of civilian nuclear energy, and the third is the nonproliferation regime. So what I propose to do is let's focus first on the deterrence relationships. Let's kind of group our questions together because even though in my head they're all related, <laughs> sometimes, um, you know, folks tend to specialize on um, one or the other. And I, I guess in the nonproliferation regime set, there's also this question of nuclear security and terrorism, and I see a couple of folks in the audience who might be interested in that. Um, we don't have name tags or name plates, so, um, and the visibility isn't great from my end, so I'm going to ask you to raise your hand and when use a microphone uh, that's closest to you and uh, identify yourself and your affiliation. So, while you're waiting or <laughs> while you're getting your thoughts, oh, I do see some. So we're going to start on the nuclear deterrence relationship in the back and then this gentleman. Okay, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Sedi, thank you for a very lucid presentation. I'm uh, Khuram. I'm the Pakistan scholar at uh, the Woodrow Wilson Center. And at the outset, let me also say that I belong and have for uh, many decades belonged to, or a couple of decades, belonged to that community within Pakistan which has opposed the nuclearization of the subcontinent and watched with dismay the, the accelerating uh, uh, nuclear arms race <clears throat> taking place over there. Uh, but when you tell the story, the story that we hear from within the peace community in Pakistan and in India, because I've been part of uh, Track 2 diplomacy and I've spoken with the counterparts in India who also feel similarly, and there are communities in both countries that feel similarly, they tell the story somewhat differently about how uh, uh, India landed up in a situation where it is seeing such complex, almost labyrinthine uh, deterrence challenges. And part of it, uh, I suppose, comes down to where you begin the story from. And uh, so the, the very basic question is, what was India's strategic intent behind going openly nuclear and testing nuclear weapons in May 1998 in the first place? Because um, what that event did, and I mean, not only testing nuclear weapons, but then turning to their Western neighbor and rattling their sabers. At the, at the, and you might recall LK Advani at that time and uh, other members of the BJP government turning towards Pakistan and saying, ha ha, now we'll show you and uh, now we claim the right of hot pursuit and we will pursue our terror your terrorists back into your territory. And you might recall the most absurd of the statements made in that uh, moment of sort of hyper-nationalistic jubilation that was sparked uh, after that moment, which came from the late Bal Thackeray saying that we had to do this event because we have to prove to the world that we are not eunuchs. Um, you know, you might, I, I invite you to remember that moment in the immediate aftermath of the nuclear tests in May 1998. And the view, <clears throat> there is a view in the peace community as well in Pakistan, which says that it's in fact that event which sparked the nuclear arms race on the subcontinent. Because prior to that event, Pakistan's nuclear ambitions were restrained and perhaps had the best restraints that they would ever have had which was that they were, Pakistanis were forced to pursue their nuclear ambitions covertly. Uh, so uh, having gone openly nuclear, what were the strategic objectives that India was trying to uh, achieve uh, as a result of that event? And do you think that India is better off uh, having gone openly nuclear, nuclear and found itself in the middle of this uh, labyrinthine deterrence uh, challenge? Thank you, and I'm so glad you've, uh, you know, put out this uh, formulation of uh, what is the strategic intent uh, that India has by doing that nuclear testing when it did. And as you've rightly pointed out, uh, how you construct the story is exactly where you start. You know, what is your starting point to be able to get to what happened in 1998? Um, I would say, what were, what were the reasons as to why India went for testing in 1998? Why, why didn't it happen earlier? Because the threat perception had existed from much before that. What was the significance of the testing only in 1998? And there are two ways of looking at this. One is, of course, the security perspective. Uh, 
With China going ahead with its nuclear weapons program, uh, the trajectory was beginning to pick up. Uh, after the economic growth of the country, we saw, it, uh, you know, from the late 1970s onwards. So there is that which is happening in China. Uh, there is news which is coming in about the nexus that is developing between China and Pakistan on the nuclear weapons program. And then you have in 1987 uh, the um, uh, interview which is given by A.Q. Khan, the father of the Pakistani nuclear weapons program, to an Indian journalist claiming that Pakistan now has the nuclear weapon. And therefore, you know, India cannot do anything. 1980s is also the period, as you know, where there were border skirmishes of several <coughs> types, particularly in the Siachen region. Uh, so the security environment is shaping up in a certain way for India. Uh, China, Pakistan, the nexus between the two, and the kind of border skirmishes which are going on during this period. In 1988, uh, Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi went to the special session on disarmament with what is uh, commonly known as the Rajiv Gandhi Action Plan, which was an, essentially a plan to work towards universal nuclear disarmament. Uh, because of the understanding that for India, its best security interests lie in nuclear disarmament. And that is also the, the understanding even today, uh, despite having acquired nuclear weapons, that the best approach for India's national security. It's not just because it's legally correct or morally correct or ethically correct to argue for nuclear disarmament, but it's in India's national security interest that there is nuclear disarmament. Because what we've seen is that with the nuclear weapons with Pakistan, uh, the insurgency in India goes up. In 1989, 1987, the interview happens, and we see from 1988, 1989 onwards, the insurgency in Kashmir goes up, which I don't know whether it's, it's correct or not. You will have a different narrative to tell. But in India, it leads to that linkage between the presence of nuclear weapons with Pakistan, uh, providing them with a shield which leads to greater acts of terrorism in India. And we saw 1998 India test, 1999 Kargil happened, which again, in our mind, provides the linkage that it was felt in Pakistan that now there is a carte blanche. You can do what you want to do, and the nuclear weapons will bind India's hands. The threat of escalation will not allow any, any reaction to take place. Now, what is the significance of India testing in 1998? And here, I think, as Sharon pointed out, these things are just so interconnected. There's a deep linkage between the non-proliferation pressures that India was beginning to feel through the 1990s, leading to the decision of testing in 1998. And irrespective of which government had been in power, if it had not been the BJP, had it been any other government in power, India had to take a call between 1996 and 1999, which is when the CTBT was concluded and put out for entry for, you know, uh, coming for entry into force. Signatures were demanded from 44 countries which were part of the annex uh, to the CTBT. And the time which was given to them was between 1996 and 1999. 1999, there was going to be a meeting of the CTBT members to decide on what would be the response for those nations that had not signed on to the CTBT, which could have meant, uh, you know, uh, sanctions, military action, all of which was to be under Chapter 7 of the United Nations Security Council. So it was very clear that if, if India had to take a call on getting off the fence, either on this side or on that side, it had to be during this period. And given the kind of security situation, having lost hope that there was ever going to be nuclear disarmament, uh, the 1995, the NPT review uh, an extension <coughs> conference had granted that indefinite and unconditional extension to the NPT. So that wasn't going to get us anywhere either. So there was a whole host of uh, developments in the security environment which led to that conclusion that we had to test, and it happened to be in 1998. Now, is India better off after testing? Yes and no. Uh, the game has become much more complex, but there was no option. And therefore, what India, uh, for India, the nuclear weapons have become something like the necessary evil. While you don't want to do it, you don't want to have these weapons, there is no way that you can defend yourself. Uh, I remember reading an article, uh, you know, when I started looking at nuclear deterrence issues, and the title of that article, which is stuck in my mind, is that you don't go to a gunfight with a knife in your hand. So if there are nuclear weapons with the other two neighbors with which there are problems that India has, and you don't have nuclear weapons of your own, 
deterrence becomes extremely difficult and you're open to nuclear coercion and blackmail and you know all kinds of issues so therefore it became necessary for india to develop those nuclear weapons but i'm ready to concede that it has brought in lots more challenges which is why the indian nuclear doctrine which is meant to operationalize your credibility of deterrence actually starts with the desire for a nuclear weapons free world and it ends with that same aspiration people call this hypocritical uh, that you know on the one hand you're developing your capability on the other hand you're still harping about uh, about disarmament but i think this twin track approach has a particular sense because it's coming from the security requirement of the country where you still see a nuclear weapons free world as the best guarantee of your security but since we are not likely to get there and quickly um in the meantime we have to protect our interests with the presence of that nuclear weapon so that's the way i would you know try and answer your question uh, another you know twice you raised the issue about it being uh, that we are in a situation of nuclear arms race i wouldn't agree with that either because what india pakistan and i would say even china to some extent are doing at this moment in time are building what is in their understanding credible minimum deterrence which is the requirement for establishing that deterrence stability uh it's not a situation of arms race and particularly not from india because the doctrine laid out as to what the requirements will be for having deterrence uh, credibility and therefore right in the doctrine in 1999 itself it has been put down that there will be certain survivability issues which will have to be taken care of which meant that the triad will come into force at some time you will need enough to cause unacceptable damage so it's the country's understanding of what would be unacceptable damage and it's a doctrine that lays down that it will be assured retaliation so in order to ensure that there is assured retaliation there is a certain uh, force structure number that has to be put in place and the software that goes with it in terms of command and control uh, all those other issues so that is what we are engaged in at this moment in time i don't think it's become an arms race right now uh, of course nuclear weapons have a tendency to acquire a life of their own which is why uh, my concern and whenever i get a chance to talk to my government it is to say that we have to stick and remain loyal to the doctrine that we've put in place which seems like an excellent doctrine we don't need to exceed the requirements of that doctrine at any point uh, but i've um, i mean uh, as we saw during the cold war the nuclear weapons in the superpowers acquired a life and momentum of their own and you know they had their logic so the three armed forces in each country were looking at building up their particular part of the arsenal i hope uh you know we've learned from that experience and that will not happen in the case of india pakistan and china hopefully uh you know for china too the american estimates uh, the dod estimates have always been that the increase in the arsenal is going to happen the numbers are going to go up to 1500 1300 at different points in time that has never happened because the logic of understanding deterrence that we have seen up till now in china is the same as what is in india that you need you don't need much for deterrence it is only to be able to threaten punishment uh, that you will cause unacceptable damage which doesn't call for much actually so i would be happy if we would stabilize at between 100 and 150 you know nuclear warheads um but how it actually pans out we'll get to see but we are presently not in a situation of arms race okay we have we had one question over here and then michael crapon i would actually uh encourage everyone to limit it to questions and keep it short <laughs> so thanks sir uh, did you have your hand up before no okay so michael thank you for the presentation nobody has ever tried let alone succeeded in stabilizing a triangular competition in nuclear arms so what india is facing is it's just it's a whole new territory and i wonder if you can tell us what are the key requirements for a stable 
triangular competition. We tend to look at this in terms of warhead numbers, delivery vehicles, but it seems to me to be a small piece of it. So can you, have you thought about what it would actually take to stabilize this triangular competition? Thank you very much, sir. Uh, as I said, uh, it's a great pleasure that you are here. Uh, uh, the first part of my talk was exactly on how the nuclear reality for India is, in which I pointed out that there is this triangular relationship of nuclear deterrence, which is so unique uh, to how, it, how India is having to you know, go over this ground. Uh, we've uh, seen how it happened in the bipolar con construct, uh, which, I mean, with, out of which there are lessons to be derived, but it certainly can't be transplanted here. So it's, as you point out, completely new territory that India is having to go over. Now, uh, a difficult question to answer in terms of what are the key paths uh, that India is looking at for deterrent stability. Um, but let me just try and uh, break it down uh, as best as I can. One is, uh, as you said, the nuclear <coughs> hardware part, uh, which is the arsenal in terms of the numbers, delivery systems, capabilities of those delivery systems, ballistic missile defense, all of that material construct of the nuclear arsenal. Uh, but the more important, I think, aspect is the software aspect, aspect of this, which is what is going to uh, convey the sense of credibility of deterrence. Um, so the software aspect of this comes with doctrinal clarity, and I think that is one part of how India is trying to stabilize the relationship by providing that doctrinal clarity, uh, by suggesting, and when India actually put out the doctrine in 1999, it came in for a lot of criticism from within the country and from outside. Uh, within the country, people were completely angry about why minimum, I mean, now you've gone down this route, why are you wanting to restrict yourself to credible minimum deterrence? Why no first use? Uh, after having acquired a nuclear weapons capability for security, why is India now binding its hands by suggesting no first use? And even today, there is a discussion on within the country to suggest that at least with Pakistan, we need to have a first use nuclear doctrine, even if it remains no first use with China, which I think is a silly argument because you can't have a doctrine which is divided in this sense. The doctrine is meant to direct your capability build up. So it leads from strategy to action to policy on the ground. And therefore, a doctrine which tells you no first use directs you to build up a certain capability which will lend credibility to that no first use. Um, so doctrinal clarity, particularly with a doctrine which is based on no first use, where you're not trying to put the adversary on edge. Uh, so he doesn't have the fear that he better use his capability or he's going to lose it. That, I think, is one software component which is, going, which is extremely important for establishing deterrent stability. So one is the doctrine. The other is the credibility that gets conveyed through the command and control system. That in case there is deterrence breakdown, if it's a doctrine, if the purpose of India's nuclear weapons is to deter through the threat of punishment, then it has to be able to show that that punishment will be carried out in case of deterrence breakdown. And in order to show that, the, the, the backup, you know, uh, requirements are then of a credible command and control system. So that's another component that goes into establishing, you know, the key part of, of establishing that deterrence stability, that you know how you will be able to handle breakdown of deterrence. And that's, so you know it better than me, the paradox of deterrence, that you have to be able to show that you want deterrence, but in order to have that deterrence, you have to have a a structure which will be able to handle deterrence breakdown. So I think working on these particular components is one way of conveying the credibility of deterrence. So while your material requirements might not be much, it's the paraphernalia that goes into establishing credibility of that deterrence, which is necessary for deterrence stability. And I think those are some of the aspects uh, that 
analysts like me would like my country to be focusing on rather than being worried about you know whether the hydrogen bomb worked or did not work does india have thermonuclear capability it does not matter with the density of populations that we are looking at carrying out unacceptable damage with a with even a 15 or a 20 kt nuclear weapon is not so difficult so your our focus has to be more on perception uh, manipulation in order to convey that there will be retaliation to cause unacceptable damage and all of these steps which are needed to make that communication is i think what is necessary for deterrence stability all right this Please use the microphone right in front of you. I'm Marco Di I'm the former science counselor at the U.S. Embassy in Beijing and the U.S. Embassy in New Delhi. I want to take issue with, with the remark of Michael Crapon, my, my colleague here, that <coughs> basically that no one ever stabilized a triangular relationship because there has been a stable triangular relationship between Russia, China, and the United States. And I think what stabilized that for the Chinese was that enough is enough. That basically the Chinese never played the game of, uh, of, excessive, excessive, of excessive production of nuclear weapons. So is enough enough? Enough is enough? Is that a possible approach India could take? Since in reality, everything is so close. Any nuclear weapon, even a nuclear weapon that goes off in Pakistan, what I said would cause unacceptable damage in India. That's a fair comment. So, but in terms of stabilizing a triangular relationship, so I'd just like to point out, for instance, when the US uh, was largely in a bipolar confrontation, when China started to become a threat in the nuclear front, there was a tendency to go towards a, some kind of a rapprochement with China, the opening up with China that happened in 1971, uh, as one way of co-opting that threat and not letting it you know, uh, become that much more. In today's environment, again, if you look at the US uh, threat perception, uh, what they have is, as part of the nuclear posture review, is nuclear terrorism and non-proliferation. The near peers, which are Russia and China, are way down in the threat perception of the US. It's rather China, I would say, which could be in that same situation of trying to arrive at a tripolar you know, uh, uh, stabilization of nuclear relationship with Russia and India on its borders. So, and we'll see how that happens, but I'm completely with you that enough is enough is the correct approach to go with nuclear weapons. You don't need much. <laughs> yeah, Lieutenant Colonel Jeff Spear with the United States Army War College. Uh, you talked about the non-state actors, uh, particularly proxies, uh, Pakistani proxies that uh, potentially pose a nuclear terrorism threat in India. Uh, does India harbor any concerns over homegrown uh, extremist organizations that that are not, not from any foreign countries? Yes, certainly we do. In fact, uh, Naxalism has grown to be a big threat. Uh, and the government is still trying to find its way around and as to how best to approach that. Um, it's largely dis disalienated, unaffected population of the country, uh, which has felt that it was deprived of uh, the kind of benefits that sh it, that that population should have gotten to, uh, the spread of I would say information and communication technology gives a boost to this kind of disaffected population because they get to see that there are benefits available to others which are not available to them. That the resources of that particular region have been taken out to you know uh, uh, provide riches to the rest of the country while they've been deprived of it. So it's certainly something which the government is very very conscious of. The um, if you read many of the articles on the even if you were just to do a Google search, you would realize how much the government itself has accepted that there is the spread of the red corridor where you've got the naxalism, which the, the number of areas which uh, they have been able to lay control on uh, is extremely high. And that uh, consciousness is there. The attempt is there to try and get them back into the mainstream. Um, and hopefully, uh, over a period of time, these results will fructify. Uh, but it's a concern that we have certainly of homegrown, uh, you know, uh, issues, which is why material security, and as I pointed out, the focus that uh, UNSCR 1540, all of the other export control issues, the WMD Act that India enacted in July 2005, the focus of all of that is to try and take away uh, the chances of unauthorized access, possession of any kind of WMD material. So it's a concern that we have. 
just to see that. Just use the microphone closest to you. How are you? I'm Daniel Caparasso from the Defense Threat Reduction Agency. I work in the Cooperative Threat Reduction Program there, uh, the non Luger Cooperative Threat Reduction Program. Um, kind of to tie on some of the comments that were just being made, um, you had mentioned that uh, India is very strong proponent of um, the anti-terrorism avenue of the uh, nuclear summit, uh, security summit process, and as well as one of the commitments was, that was made was for the Global Center on Nuclear Energy Partnership, and that trying to see, when it was originally um, announced, there seemed to be a little bit of a tie between those two events in that um, it wasn't just an energy partnership um, uh, facility, but maybe one where security components would be integrated in training for, for, for Indians uh, and the like. And a, and a memorandum of understanding between uh, our two governments was signed at that point uh, to assist in some of that. Um, something we've noticed in the interim between those, those points and now is um, some reticence on the side of the Republic of India to engage with uh, the U.S. government on, on items of nuclear security and that global center. I'm uh, just curious if you have any comments or thoughts on whether that was a short term or more of a, um, an immediate term response to just getting that facility up and moving. As you said, the foundation was just laid this year and whether there was um, any type of of uh, coordinated effort on, on the Republic's side of the next summit uh, in trying to continue the thought on nuclear security as opposed to some of the civil side and safeguard components that, that have kind of been brought to the fore for this coming summit. Uh, I think uh, the reticence that you mentioned between the Indo-US relationship on this is something that you might be well aware of in the public domain in India. Uh, we've not come across any such, uh, you know, mention of uh, the pos of, of any kind of lack of coordination or understanding between the two countries. Uh, the GCNEP, even though the foundation stone has just been laid, uh, has been working off-site already. And the idea is to have four schools as part of the GCNEP, which will be looking at the technical as well as uh, on the security, safeguards, etc. issues as part of the uh, global center. Uh, how it's actually going to function, will it be performing training activities or will it be doing more of research, are still issues which haven't come out very clearly. Um, though from what I've been given to understand from the Department of Atomic Energy that some amount of off-site activity on these in terms of uh, training of trainers, etc., is already continuing. Uh, but uh, I would say uh, there is very little um, debate within the country on many of these aspects, though the the, the thought of nuclear terrorism, you know, is, is very high. The consciousness of the dangers that come from any kind of unauthorized access of nuclear material is very high. Um, you don't see that much of writing on these particular issues coming from the strategic community because they are still completely focused on deterrence issues, energy issues. And this is relatively new ground where you are largely leaving it to the government to take the lead on many of these issues. Now, I am not saying that it's the correct approach to be doing. There's certainly, I mean, from the strategic community, the more you start writing on this, it uh, raises the, the priority that the government would be allocating to a subject like this. Uh, so, but that uh, consciousness in the strategic community is yet to filter down. And you know what uh, the report that, for instance, uh, Deepti brings out on the, new, on the uh, index um, hasn't got its fair share of, uh, uh, of interest generated yet. Uh, hopefully, that will change over a period of time. Just to follow up on that. I was surprised in talking to some IEA folks about Pakistan's nuclear security support center. They were quite complimentary. <laughs> they said, yeah, Pakistan's doing a great job. They're doing all this training. They're doing regional training. Um, I just wondered, you know, is, I, I mean, obviously Pakistani nuclear security um, must be an issue <laughs> in India concern. Did, is there any talk about it? How, how do you feel about Pakistan doing regional training on nuclear material security? Let's be clear, nuclear material security, not nuclear weapons. I would say I'm very happy that uh, that's happening uh, because uh, the kind of experience that we've had with the security uh, issues in Pakistan, if they are taking the lead now in providing 
training for material security. Obviously, they have, and if the IAE is complementing them or them on that, so obviously they have learned also in the process as to how to carry out that material security. And that's a great source of uh, comfort for us that uh, there is that understanding that they're able to provide that and that it is up to certain standards that internationally have been laid down uh, for establishing that kind of material security. Pakistan was, I think, one of the first centers of excellence that came up. And given the, the background that they had in terms of the amount of criticism that they came under after 2003, 4, once the AQ Khan revelations came out, BBC China was caught with the, you know, in, in Libya, all of that uh, provided, I think, uh, the platform for Pakistan to want to change its image uh, by having a certain, a certain center of excellence which would be doing this kind of work. And if it's lived up to whatever expectations that the IAEA had out of the center of excellence, uh, I think as an Indian, it gives me some comfort. So one of the trends, just to follow up on that, um, with these centers of excellence, there's been this proliferation of these centers. Mm -hmm. One of the trends is to get them to collaborate with each other. <laughs> it's easier said than done, but the IEA uh, has put together this network. Um, I've been working in the Asian sphere. Um, is this an area where India and Pakistan, uh, you know, their tiny, tiny, tiny little confidence building measure could actually make some progress? Certainly, I think it's uh, it's worth looking at in terms of confidence building. One of the measures, uh, at least uh, exchange of best practices on nuclear safety and security, whether independently or as part of this network of you know centers of excellence, uh, would certainly help. And I think it has been on the. Um, on the list of the items that India and Pakistan, when they get to sit together, talk about on nuclear CBMs. Uh, as I pointed out earlier, some of the best nuclear CBMs were drafted as part of the Lahore Agreement. Uh, unfortunately, that never got anywhere, which is why there is a bitter taste about how to get those CBMs. If the political relationship is as tense at different points in time as it is between India and Pakistan, the need for the CBMs is that much more. But it's a chicken and egg situation. Do we need political trust to get to CBMs, or can CBMs generate political trust over a period of time? And I think uh, we would be willing to explore it either way. And if there is scope for taking these baby steps of some kind without compromising any kind of uh, uh, you know, security concerns that the two countries have, it's a great idea. In fact, amongst the CBMs, I, I have also recommended uh, that we need to do, for instance, a joint study on what would be the effect of the detonation of a nuclear weapon uh, on cities like Karachi and Mumbai. Uh, you know, if you know what is the extent of damage that's going to happen as a result of that, it goes into establishing deterrence. Uh, you realize, is it going to be worth it to use a nuclear weapon if this is what we're <laughs> going to end up with? Uh, so in order to, you know, get better understanding of what is unacceptable damage, it would be a good idea to do a joint study on uh, what the impact of an uh, explosion is on some of the major cities. So there are lots of approaches on CBMs, and this is definitely a welcome idea. See. Deep T's hand up in the back. So Manpreet, thank you again for what I think I already told you is a tour de force um, review of all these issues. I want to pick up on a few strings, particularly on the nuclear security and broadly using this term of confidence building measures. And I actually want to re-characterize uh, India's engagement in the nuclear security summit process. I'm not sure I would say that it was as active or deep an engagement. Um, as, as you've captured it. And one of the reasons that there's been this issue about this center of excellence is that it took some real arm twisting from the US to even get the nuclear security part of the mandate into that center of excellence. It's one of like four parts, I think, of that mission. And so I think that's why you're seeing that hesitancy. The Indians really wanted it to be about actually the nuclear, the civil, civilian nuclear energy training. Um, but I want to actually come back to this thing around, you know, that you're in favor of confidence building measures around best practice exchanges, and yet we have seen the Indian and Pakistani Sherpas trip over themselves in agreeing with one another to weaken language in the current negotiations about um, measures just like that 
about how countries can be working with one another to build confidence about the effectiveness of their nuclear security practices. And that's, to me, so dismaying when both India and Pakistan are the two countries that have real security issues at risk and, in fact, should be engaging in that. And yet, in these official processes, they're, they're actually trying to make sure that they themselves are not accountable, other countries aren't accountable for their um, possession of these materials. So I just wanted to kind of bring that insight into this because this is one of those things that could actually impact some of those deterrence calculations about the buildup of these materials. How do we better understand that non-state actor risk, particularly with the Hindu Mujahideen um, revelations that um, they were looking for a nuclear bomb? So I'm just gonna, I just wanted to make that comment. Um, but thank you. Thank you, Deepthi, for that comment. Um, uh, and you know, um, I can't defend, I can't, I'm not speaking for my government in any case, but uh, sometimes common sense is not so common. <laughs> so while you might see it as, uh, you know, a shared threat that you are facing, the political environment has not allowed uh, for some steps to be taken, which uh, is more out of a, a sheer blocking of the mind from taking those steps, you know, despite realizing that there is some benefit for both sides. And often CBMs only function when you realize that there's a benefit, there's a mutuality of benefit for both sides. So that has to filter down from this fog of political mistrust that has existed between the two. Uh, I mean, I always remain hopeful. <laughs> the, uh, a, a period of uh, relative peace will hopefully, you know, allow for these openings to come up. But the whole uh, point about the strategic community on both sides and from outside is to keep some of these ideas ready for when there is an acceptability uh, for them. And that's hopefully what we are trying to do. So I really appreciate your, uh, your, your suggestion on this. Um, question here. Can we Good morning, I'm Edward from the French Embassy. So I'd like to switch to the second part about the civilian uh, nuclear. So you mentioned the objective of the 20,000 megawatt of, uh, of electricity generated by nuclear reactors. And so this 20,000 megawatt would come from 20 new reactors. So my first question would be, where would this reactor come from? And the second point that I'd like to mention is you talked about some indigenous uh, reactors. So does it mean that India has the, uh, the capabilities to, to build uh, nuclear reactors? Yes, basically that's it, thank you. That since over a period of time, India was not engaged in any kind of international access to nuclear technology, uh, what we've ended up having is completely indigenous nuclear power program. So the 21 reactors which are functioning today, except for one which has come from Russia, which is the latest reactor, the rest are all, and two that came from the US, all the other nuclear <coughs> reactors have been indigenously built. Uh, so the technology exists. Why India was keen on getting nuclear cooperation from outside is because the indigenous capability that India has at the moment is only for a 700 megawatt nuclear reactor. And if the requirement for nuclear energy is so large, what we are keen to have is larger capacity nuclear reactors coming in, which, uh, for instance, the French reactor is 1650 megawatts. We are nowhere near building indigenously that kind of a capability and therefore the interest in getting nuclear reactors from outside. So whether it's from the US, which would be 1,000 plus megawatt reactors, or from the French, or from the South Koreans, or from the Russians, again, between 1,100 and 1,300 megawatt reactors, this is a capability that India does not currently have. So what we are standardizing at is a 700 megawatt reactor, which is the highest capacity that India is able to build indigenously. Now, where is this capacity of 20,000 megawatts going to come from? It's going to come from seven 700 megawatt nuclear reactors that India is building indigenously. And as I pointed out, since fuel is now available from outside, 
because there is a fuel constraint within the country and also the quality of uranium that India mines is very low. In fact, uh, the Australians tell us they discard that as tailings, you know, which, which we use in our nuclear reactors. So the access to good quality uranium uh, from outside will help us to fuel the nuclear reactors that India wants to build indigenous, indigenously. These are to be supplemented with some imported reactors from outside. And from the French, for instance, there's a site in Maharashtra, Jaitapur, which has been allocated for setting up the French reactors. Now, when Fukushima happened, Jaitapur was undergoing uh, uh, some issues about land acquisition and rehabilitation, uh, compensation to be pay paid for the land that was being acquired by the government. After Fukushima, the nuclear safety issue, uh, anti-nuclear energy lobby, land acquisition, land rehabilitation, all of this has got mixed up and created the kind of trouble that it did in Jaitapur. Hopefully, I mean, over a period of time, these issues have been resolved. Now, what the status that we are on is the price negotiations that are going on between the NPCIL and Arriva to get the Jaitapur plants going as quickly as possible. Okay, we have time for just Two last questions, Dan and then this gentleman over here. Hi, Dan Horner from Arms Control Today. I wanted to ask about the nuclear suppliers group. You mentioned the actions India has taken and said um, the NSG is still not ready to accept India. And I wanted to ask you why you think that is, because I, mean, I can tell you what I've heard from talking to uh, officials from some of the countries in the NSG, that there is, um, first of all, this, this uh, criterion for membership of the NSG that uh, being a uh, NPT party or being a member of a um, nuclear weapons free zone, which India isn't. Secondly, sort of resentment at, at the way the countries were pressured to, to vote in favor of the India exception in 2008. And thirdly, um, a sense that that vote was um, in some ways damaging to the non-proliferation regime, so they're un unwilling to take a further step to sort of um, uh, in, in that direction. So. Uh, is that your, are you hearing that? And what is your explanation for, for why the NSG is reluctant to, to accept India at this point, in spite of the actions that India has taken? Thanks. And then let's take the. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay, thank you for the wonderful presentation. Um, my name is uh, Masachi Kushi, and I'm visiting scholar at uh, Johns Hopkins University at SAIS, uh, fr and uh, originally from Meiji, Japan. So uh, I have one, only one question about the public acceptance of nuclear power plant. Uh, so as you mentioned the, in the presentation, uh, I also think the uh, government, the Indian government, has confidence to start smoothly. Uh, but uh, some people claim that the local uh, oppositional movements are uh, aggressive, and uh, some uh, some local government and uh, some local Congress, Congress are vulnerable, vulnerable from the, these political oppositional movements. So, how do you think about the uh, impact on uh, oppositional movements? Uh, do you think that uh, uh, these movements have an impact on the makes uh, the project delayed for a couple of years? Uh, uh, for example, so now could you give me some comment, please? Should I? Very interesting last two points, and I'm glad uh, you know they've come up in some form or the other. The NSG membership, I mean, um, as far as I can see, I know which is the country which is trying to block India from becoming a member of the NSG, and I think it, it should be clear. But um, the two issues that you've mentioned, which are taken as loosely the criteria for membership of NSG, um, membership of the NPT, I think that uh, became a non-issue when India was granted the exceptionalization as part of the NSG to become a member of international nuclear commerce. Uh, so NPT is, I mean, it was with the understanding that India was not a member, sh member of the NPT and therefore had to be exceptionalized. So this I don't think should be an issue any longer. The resentment that they feel on the, on the deal that was granted, well, if the countries feel that resentment, uh, they are the ones who've granted that exceptionalization. So that's, a, that's uh, an issue that they have to treat within themselves as to why should they feel that despite having granted that exceptionalization on certain objective criteria uh, which was presented to them uh, in terms of India's non-proliferation behavior. Uh, now, if I could just extrapolate that situation a little, you know, if you look at it 10 years from now, who are the countries that are going to be the active players in the NSG? 
Germany has phased out its nuclear power program. Uh, some of the other members of the NSG, in any case, are bit players in terms of supplies. So what you're looking at in 10 years' time, uh, essentially, are going to be China uh, emerging as a nuclear supplier. They have expressed great interest in export of their nuclear capability, technology, power plants. Uh, Russia, uh, South Korea, these are some of the countries which have ambition on being important nuclear suppliers. And India, which has a capability of setting up at least 220 megawatt nuclear power plants, uh, at the moment has not expressed a desire to become a nuclear supplier, uh, which will change over a period of time. Right now, because of the internal demand of nuclear energy within the country, the entire focus has been inward-oriented in, in investment. Uh, so you don't want to extend yourself outside. But with the kind of capability, with the region, Bangladesh, uh, you know, some of the smaller countries in the region, Vietnam, having expressed an interest in nuclear energy. With the kind of smaller grids that they have, it would make ample sense for a kind of nuclear reactor that India has to be set up in many of these countries to actually be useful for their grids, rather than Bangladesh going in for a Russian reactor, which is going to be a 1,000 megawatt reactor. With the grid being as small as it is, in case there was any trouble, you run into a loss of you know 1,000 megawatt of electricity directly. So why not go in for smaller reactors? That is going to be the logic. And India will emerge as a nuclear supplier over a period of time, as you know our own issues get sorted out. Uh, so in the NSG, if you look at who the major players will be and whether it makes sense for India to be a part of the NSG or not, it's completely a decision that the NSG has to make. From my perspective, it makes sense to bring India in. If it doesn't, it, it doesn't really matter. India is not losing out anything by not being a member of the NSG right now. Uh, bilateral arrangements have worked out well. Things will become smoother if India becomes a part of the NSG. But it's it's not really such a you know uh, live or die issue for the country right now. On public acceptance, I mean that is the biggest issue that uh, you know has come up in the nuclear energy field across the world. Everywhere, people are facing the same situation. Um, and as I try to point out, I mean, the ways in which India is trying to get over that problem is be by becoming more open and transparent on the nuclear power uh, program as a whole, which wasn't there earlier. So the sense of going in for nuclear power, the limitations that India has in terms of sourcing electricity from other sources, the demand which is so huge, I mean, the per um, you know, uh, capita availability of electricity for India right now is at 700 uh, uh, kilowatt hours uh, per capita, whereas in a country like the US, it's 13,000 kilowatt hours per capita availability. According to the Human Development Index, uh, you have to graduate to a developed country. You have to have 4,000 megawatt per hour, uh, uh, kilowatt hour capability uh, per capita. So if you have to reach that kind of a target, uh, whether it's a country like China with 1 billion plus, whether it's a country like India with a billion, uh, the demand is just so huge that you can't rule out nuclear energy. But people have to be, over a period of time, convinced of the logic of nuclear energy and, the, and that it's a safe source of energy. Uh, fortunately for us, we've never had any major incident in India. Uh, hopefully, that will be how it remains. And uh, with efforts of the government, we will get around this problem. But it has been politicized. There are all kinds of local opposition groups which are with different agendas at play. Um, it's a challenge that will have to be gotten over. In democracies, they sometimes spin out of control, but I think uh, we will be able to get over it. Do, do you think India needs to improve some aspects of its nuclear governance, like the independence of its nuclear regulation? Yes, that is an issue that uh, is extremely important for feeding into public acceptance, because that's how you build confidence in it. Uh, India has had an atomic energy regulatory board right from the beginning, but the issue came up about the independence of, because when Fukushima happened, the whole issue about regulatory capture, that you've got the same set of people who are also promoting nuclear energy, regulating nuclear energy came up. And in response to that, there is a new nuclear security regulatory uh, uh, authority, which is which has been sanctioned, it is awaiting uh, parliamentary approval to come into place. The parliament hasn't functioned over a period of time for various reasons, but uh, this is how uh, uh, the independence aspect of uh, governance is going to be improved.
But I would say nuclear safety is never a destination. It's always a work in progress and you, there's no room for complacency. So efforts at improvement across the world will have to just continue. I think we can all agree on that very positive <laughs> last note. Listen, thank you. As an audience, you've been very patient. We've gone over a little um, in our time. Thank you for your questions. And please join me in thanking Dr. Manpreet Sethi. Thank you very much. Thank you. I just brought along a set of oh, books uh, from my center and uh, Thank you. I hope that I've done a nuclear strategy Thank for you and for the oh CSIS. Gosh. It's tomorrow's my birthday, so oh. um, I'm keeping these. Yeah.